Welcome to Unmasking Humanity 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. And today we have a very special guest, Hadassah Shozhana. And I hope I pronounced that right. Please forgive me, Hadassah, if I didn't. But this is going to be awesome. And look, I could sit here and talk for four hours about why this is going to be a great broadcast. Um, but Hadessa is a communication expert. She's not only, she's more than a speech therapist. And I know that's one of her taglines and I think that's her website too, but she really is. She's one of the most fascinating people that I've ever met, but also one of the strongest people I've ever met. She is a warrior, um, but her heart for other people, her, her heart to fight injustice and fight on behalf of those who don't have access to proper medical care or those who have been screwed over by the healthcare system. I mean, she's just somebody that you want in your corner. I'm honored and blessed to call her a friend. Um, I typically, I think I've said this before, I don't really interview my friends, but here lately I've had this opportunity where I'm getting to talk to a lot of my friends and these 21 questions are helping me get to know them even more. Uh, but the questions are each crafted for every single guest, specifically for them, their expertise and what they're about. And this is meant to pull more out of them to really show who they are, hence unmasking. But Hadessa is the real deal. Um, she has been a great blessing in my life and helping me learn how to communicate better. Um, and really just, really just even some other skills that I've been able to learn from her just from her way of being and what who she is as a coach. But this is going to be great. Um, these questions are very difficult. I spent a lot of time on these questions because I know Hadessa and I want to challenge her. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, want to, I want to put her against the corner, so to speak, and see what she's made out of, but in a nice, friendly way. Uh, this is going to be this is going to be tough for her, I think. But at the same time, I expect her uh, to handle all of these questions with an excellence because she's truly an expert in her field. And you all are going to learn a lot today. I know I am. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my friend, Hadessa, to Unmasking Humanity, 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Unmasking Humanity, 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. I am so honored to introduce you to our guest, Hadessa Shozana. Did I say that right? Did I say it right? Hadessa? I said it right. I'm asking you. What's up, Hadessa? How are you? <laughs> do you want to say it right? <laughs> I do want to say Oh, I thought I said it right. Oh, see? You know? <laughs> please, please correct me. Here's okay, here's go. the inflection of the syllabic inflection and the prosody. It goes Hadassa Shoshana. 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 Hadassa Shoshana. Shoshana. Oh, that's way better than I said it's it. Like sh and sh and na. <laughs> Shoshana. <laughs> I, I, I think I told you before I started that I tried to, re it took me 15 minutes to do the intro and the intro is like one minute long, but it took me 15 minutes because I kept messing up and then I got in my head and I'm like, look, and the fact is that I know you. And yeah. so it made it even more difficult. So anyway, I am really excited about this because ever since we first reconnected again for the third time, um, I've been wanting to do this. And to finally have the opportunity to interview you uh, is very special to me. And I'm absolutely honored to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I, I watched some of your work um, before when I met you in like 2018. And then, you know, moving into, you know, 2019 when uh, there were some transitions in both of our lives. And being able to see the movement um, in you and the growth that I've seen in you is just super inspiring, which is really great. And then the work that you're doing with um, your ministry and how you come to the table to lift others up in their, in their pursuit, 
that that is a God-given pursuit is just a really spectacular gift that you have. So truly it's an honor to be here too in that in that um in that way of uh equality. It's it's a mutual honor, I would say. Thank you for that. Um before we start, I would love to know what are you grateful for today and why? In its simplicity, I'm grateful that my eyes opened this morning. And um, in its simplicity, I know that when my eyes open, that I still have a purpose and that that purpose doesn't come from me. And that purpose comes from that deepest part of me that is leading me to the greatest expression of me. So in the minutia of me opening my eyes, it's still such a profound thing because I... I know that there's a reason for that. On the other side, I've had some amazing breakthroughs with my patients today. And I always just love to have progress that is tangible with my patients. And when they get to experience that in themselves and they feel what I've been sharing them, sharing with them that is about themselves, I share with them what they can accomplish. I share with them what they can do. I share with them what they can achieve. And then they achieve little increments of that. And that is such a gift. So um, it is is a blessing to receive life from God and then to give and, and to provide uh, a, a pathway to an achievement in someone else too. It's the best gratitude answer I've ever heard. Oh my gosh, that's a good grat. I can just stop the broadcast here. I'll just cut that. I'll publish that part. <laughs> Jeez, that was a good answer. I appreciate that. I'm telling you, I would say that 90% of the guests kind of give it a generic answer. And it's not the hate on them, but that was a real gratitude answer. I love that. Okay, are you ready for 21 questions? I am ready for 21 questions. <laughs> I'm so ready for this. All right. <laughs> Question one. How does your trauma-informed approach differ from traditional speech therapy methods, and how does it enhance outcomes for your clients? Great question. I, I see individuals as a continuum. So they've experienced something that has caused a response in their life. And then that response has either provided a pathway to uh, achievement, success, or it has kind of halted their experience. And so when I come from an approach from a trauma lens, trauma-informed lens, what I'm doing is seeing a person for the holistic part of them, knowing that the reason why they might experience or they might behave in certain ways or they might respond in certain ways or they might uh, not believe in the, what you're saying, uh, there's, there's a manner in which a sensitivity in that lies and that provides a kind of calmness and a relaxation in my patients mm. because they feel understood and in that feeling of understanding they are they are willing to kind of go through the process that we as therapists and professionals who are coming in from the outside evaluating them and giving them an opportunity to see one themselves and two, seeing where they can get to with our help. So the, the therapist and patient or client interaction requires such a deep sensitivity of listening. And when we can listen through a trauma lens, we see that everyone has gone through some sort of trauma that requires sensitivity. And so in that sensitivity, I'm able to provide more consistent care 
more loving care, more patient care, um, and really truly hear my patients so that when they do get to a place where they feel like, oh, I just can't do this, or I'm not getting anywhere, nothing's working, I can target where those narratives came from. And if I know where those narratives came from, then I can administer a counter narrative that can support them in reaching their goals. Wow. That was a tough question out of the gate and you just crushed it. Did I answer the question? Sometimes I feel like I tangent, you know, because I just love talking. <laughs> but, you know. I have that problem too. That's why I'm doing this format. It keeps me from talking as much. Fair, <laughs> like, fair enough. <laughs> I, I, are, I have like 50 questions to ask you out of that answer, but I can't. I got to go to question two. Okay. Oh, really good. All right. Number two. Can you describe a particularly challenging case where your communication mastery coaching significantly improved a client's interpersonal relationships? Can you repeat the question? Okay. Sorry about that. Can you describe a particularly, I have a really hard time with that word. Can you describe a particularly challenging case where your communication mastery coaching significantly improved a client's interpersonal relationships. This is a challenging question because it's one thing to share information with someone and it's another thing for someone to implement that information. And so I, I have shared information and communication mastery with my clients and it's challenging to implement because in that space these patterns of communication have just been happening for decades and it's it's challenging for them to to implement a new change now what i'll say is that that information makes them more sensitive and thereby more aware of themselves in that moment or in those moments and allows for them to provide, implement, administer, interject a, a new way. And so what I'll share is the story that comes up in my mind that improved outcomes in my patient when he was essentially on his deathbed. He was his wife fell and he went into a deep darkness, aspirated, got aspiration pneumonia, was depressed, didn't want to do anything. And with speech therapy and swallow recovery and rehab, there's a sy systematic process. Like we can't just go in and, and give people food once they're aspirating or, we will see repercussions of that, especially if a person already has a diagnosis of pneumonia, aspiration pneumonia at that. And so he didn't want to go do any of his activities of daily living, like going to the bathroom or going to um, going to therapy or going to physical therapy or going to um, do any exercise at all. And that exercise is so important because it helps make the lungs expand and contract. And so in order for me to work on swallowing things, I, I need this person to go to physical therapy. I went into the room one day and I was just like, God, you need to give me an answer of what, how to serve this person right now. So I went in with my markers and my paper and my scissors and my tape. And I asked him to share stories of inspiration, good memories, people in his life that he loved, qualities that he saw in himself, part of his history that he was really proud of. And I keyworded all of that. And I put it in big, like cursive, pretty writing with all different colors. And I posted it to his wall where there was nowhere else to look but that wall. 
And as he looked at that wall, 24 hours while he was sitting in his bed, not doing anything, not watching TV, but just staring at this wall, he eventually started getting up out of his bed by himself, started going to therapy, started working out, what? started walking. And his goal was ice cream. So I was like, okay, so when, when someone is aspirating, there's this idea of putting someone on a, a high viscosity liquid that moves a little bit more slowly so that there's a less risk of aspiration. There's some differing research on that. Um, I've seen it work in some of my sessions, so I've used it. So in this particular case, he was on a really thick and liquid and at the time it was like 10 years ago. So that was something that he wanted to obviously get off, but ice cream, when it melts, it's not a, it's not a thick and liquid, it's a thin liquid. So um, there's a higher risk in that. So working towards ice cream is like the highest goal, you know, it's like it's the highest goal. And when we were done, I bought some Tahiti vanilla ice cream and he and I shared the pint and he got to go home. And that was spectacular for me. Just like the power of words, the power of remembering who we are and what we do and the people in our lives and why we were created, why we were, why we were created, because there's an intrinsic motivation in that of why we were created. And so if anyone comes to me in some way that says, I wanna change my communication, my interpersonal relationships, I let them know that there's got to be a deep motivation. And in that deep motivation, there will be a movement. And in that movement will lie your expression with interpersonal relationships inevitably. It'll just inevitably get better. Question three. That was good. And by the way, those kind of stories are really inspiring to me because it just shows you that God's God's not done with us. And, and people so are just so amazing. You know, if they're just given the right opportunities, like you can see a child who has poor behavior just enliven you can see a person who has dementia wake up and have more lucid moments there's just a beauty in being able to have this listening sensitivity with with our interpersonal relations so that we can improve the quality of life for someone just for that moment that we're interacting with them so awesome question three what are some of the most common blind spots in communication you've observed and how do you help clients overcome them? So we've touched on this. So great question. Listening is always the answer. <laughs> it's always listening. And the challenge with listening is that we're listening through through our lens of the world. We're not listening through the lens of someone else because we simply cannot be inside someone else. And so we listen with this with this self-understanding instead of an understand instead of a desire to understand someone else. And that's basic. That's like the basic answer. What's the second part of the question? How do you help clients overcome them? Okay, to overcome this, it requires a lens of trauma-informed, a trauma-informed lens. Because when we can listen to the narrative of our own internal trauma and understand it from a place that we can deconstruct it and why those narratives were created because no one listened to us, in our silence. No one listened to us when we had something to say. No one understood us in that place. When we have a, an acute self-awareness in that place, we can offer that to someone else. But if we don't have that for ourselves, we simply cannot offer it to somebody, someone else. And so there's a, a, a deepness, a depth of listening that requires 
an internal reflective process that says, I'm going to figure out why I don't understand myself. And when I don't understand myself, ergo, I'm not listening to myself or what I need or how I need it or what I want or my desires. If I don't know those things to the, to the, to the minutia, we simply cannot provide that for someone else. It's impossible. So our inner connection to listening to ourselves and having that narrative of like, hey, like what's going on? Like I'm feeling a certain way. Like, where is this coming from? Is it now? And then you get to to your friend who's who's going through that experience and you're no longer trying to just tell them what to do. <laughs> you're not trying to solve their problems. <laughs> You're, you're there as a listener to help extract out of them that pain that's causing them to be misunderstood. And in that place of being misunderstood, because that person on the outside is now understanding them, there's a deep connection and, and a, a breakdown of that trauma process and a building of a new, a new behavioral pattern that comes through self-communication given to somebody else i'm going to break the third wall here um and just say this you do this in real life you've done it with me you don't let me speak from a place of trauma and it's been for all the things that i've been able to learn from you and and all the ways that you've helped me that is probably one of the biggest things like if i'm speaking from a place of trauma you're quick to correct me. And I appreciate that. Is it a correction? Do you feel like it's a correction? <laughs> or do you feel like it's a place where you can feel safe to express yourself? Like, I wonder that because correction denotes that something is wrong. And there's nothing wrong per se. It's just that there's, there's an opportunity to hear each other better so that we can understand each other better and then kind of move forward into a place that is more synergistic and um, egalitarian instead of just like, you know, one person knows more or less or whatever. It's just the focus is really just trying to understand one another and oneself. Okay, I like what you said better. <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah not correction what you said that's perfect all right next question gosh that was good how do you tailor your approach when working with adults recovering from traumatic brain injury versus those with neurodegenerative diseases so simply put it's the same it is essentially the same because we're wanting people to be successful in their life. We want people to be successful in the partici participation of life and their activity level in life. So we kind of take that framework of like, you know, what's actually wrong physiologically and neurologically. And then the, the second and third piece are, you know, participation and activity the activity level in life and being able to have access to that. So someone who has a traumatic brain injury or stroke um, is had has a life that is still ongoing and it's not a neurodegenerative process per se. Um, it's it's an impact that caused a complete change in in their life. And now they're learning to live with this impact and then continue these areas of their life that um, may have been changed as a result of the effects of the brain injury or stroke. They're, they are still focused on participating in life to the fullest. And same with those with dementia. With dementia, we want to we want to provide an environment for them to thrive. So it's not about removing things from their life, but it's about providing the right support in the environment that allows them to experience life in the fullest and participate in the, the activities that they want to participate in. So it's kind of the same, but it's like with neurodegenerative diseases, it's a slow progression of degeneration versus the brain injury, which is just an impact and thereby 
generally with people who have had a brain injury or a neurological impact, um, they want to get back to, you know, their, their families and having children and having jobs and um, being active in the community. With neurodegeneration, there's kind of a loss of desire for that sometimes. And um, we do our best to integrate uh, people who have these syndromes into into various activities that are happening in facilities or in you know their homes with their families and so basically it's truly about how they access life and what the quality of their life is and if their quality of life is great even if they have very severe dementia if they're happy every single time you see them and they're not worried and they're having a good time you know what you're doing is working that's awesome. Next question. Can you explain the connection between nutritional interventions and cognitive health? And how do you incorporate these into your practice? This is an interesting question. So I recently began studying and researching the effects of various toxins on the brain, including parasites and heavy metals. And I learned that these two, two aspects of health and wellness and toxification have a root in causing all, can I say all, a lot, if not all, all of the inflammation in, in our bodies. There's an activation of an inflammation process. And that inflammation process creates cognitive impact, confusion, um, loss of memory, loss of executive functions, not being able to plan and carry out various tasks in an organized way, missing appointments, mm -hmm. things like that. And so what's so interesting is that I'm, I'm in a field of allopathic medicine. And in the field of allopathic medicine, there's no room for detoxification and nutritional interventions because the quality of what's being provided is, is such a low grade quality. It's not like organic, non-GMO food. Like there's, we're still serving food to populations that can cross the blood brain barrier and create create parasitosis in the brain and we're not educated in those areas so when i see my patients from this allopathic perspective who have just been indoctrinated by that allopathic system they they will listen to the education but have a very hard time implementing that education and it's my duty to educate i can't make someone do the next step though. I can't. I can say research it because it's all out there for you. It's not even new research. It's old research, decades old research of reversals of various neurodegenerative diseases through nutritional and detoxification processes that decrease oxidative stress and decrease the, the heavy metals and parasites in, inside of the body as a result inside of the brain as well. And so I have been met with a, a, a warm receptivity to the education. However, very little carryover into an implementation of a protocol because there is there is a, a pattern, a behavior, a habit of someone else is going to fix me. I'm going to go over there and they're going to give me something and that thing is going to fix me. Mm -hmm. And this is simply not how it works. It's like we have to get to a place where we have take responsibility for our own education and our own intellect and administer our own methods of healing. I'll tell you, I've been through personally i've been through such extraordinary illnesses so many and i never once went to a doctor never never once went to an allopathic doctor and 
I just listened to, I, I, I begged for an answer. Yeah, of course I begged for an answer. I was on my knees begging for an answer, but I knew that the medical, the, the typical medical model wasn't going to serve me. So I, I dove into the research and that research um, has just proven to be so extremely effective. And yeah, I, I would say that there's a, a tad resistance in, in the field where people are just not yet willing to go down that road. And it's, it's a little disheartening because there's, there's an answer and it, and it requires a behavioral change and we're not all ready for that yet. This is where I wish I wasn't doing 21 questions because I could give you an hour's worth of response, but I align with you. I'll just keep it simple. We'll do a tangent. <laughs> we'll do a tangent show of all the, all the things that we want to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Because I have a lot to say about that. Um, and I know you do too, that we're kind of keeping the, you know, in the lane here. But yes, I a hundred percent. And the parasite thing is a is a really big problem. I've had other doctors on and they talk about the parasite problem that we have. And I mean, they blame it. They, they to get really out there, they, there's studies that prove, or that pr I say prove, because you know how studies work. Sure. But they say that parasites are linked to homosexuality. Like there's a tie in there. There's a tie to, I mean, you've talked about other diseases and cancers and other things like I, I don't really know all the full science of it i just know that this is a much bigger issue that is right under everyone's nose maybe literally made it inside their body yeah and to your point people are just i don't know if it's denial it's like saying oh i have herpes i don't want to go do something about it or i have hiv and i don't want to go do something about it like honestly i think parasites are worse well, those things are parasites. Those are, you know what I'm saying? Like those things are. And so it's like people say bacteria so readily. And it's like, you know, that bacteria is a parasite. It's, it's, it's a type of parasite. So, you know, the research is there. Like it's, it's not hard to find. Um, it's very accessible. And there's a lot of really extraordinary people talking about it. And, and, I'm a firm believer that if we truly want to know the truth, it will arrive at the right time. <laughs> and when we receive the truth, we have a choice Ooh. to either look at that truth and do something with it or to sustain the way of life before we receive that truth, which is in complete defiance of it. So, this is my shoulder shrug, man. This is what it is. It's like, <laughs> like we get a choice. That's right. Question six. What inspired you to expand your practice beyond traditional speech therapy into communication mastery coaching? Wow, that's a good question. Okay, so I don't think I I, I don't think I made a decision to do that. I think it was a natural progression in in what I was what I was what I'm at, what I am put on earth to do. Um, I just I love communication. I love it. I love restoring communication. And I have been doing this since I was a child. Like I have been volunteering with special needs and reading and speech and language and just all things communication and interaction and interpersonal relationships. Like I've been doing that my whole life. And so people ask me like, how did you get into this? And I'm like, well, I don't think I got into it. I think it got into me and it just expressed itself through me. And so I allowed the progression to, to occur. And it was a, a time in my life in 2018 when I had, I had been so burnt out by the system. It just like took all of me. It just took all of me. And I was in a place of like desolation. I was like, what am I gonna do with my life? And at the time I was, 
you know, in, in a bunch of practices that were not very good practices that kind of opened portals to, to really dark places. Uh, and in that, I, I learned I learned about transform transformation and transformative communication. And when I learned that, I, I realized that it was something that I was inherently doing in my life already and doing with my patients every single day. And I was like, wow, this is like something I do all the time. It's not even something new. Mm -hmm. And, and so I wanted to cut, showcase that and focus on that because I believe that learning is such a gift. It's a gift to just keep learning and learning and learning and expanding and growing and not doing the same thing over and over and over again. And I had just done the clinical thing for so long. So in 2018, when I stopped working as a speech language pathologist and let my license go, and I was just like this, I'm just going to take a full sabbatical. I don't know how many years it's going to be. And uh, I allowed myself to unfold this other transformative process that was wanting to express itself through me, which was communication mastery. So I, I held workshops in Chicago. They were great. Um, I had such great feedback. I started uh, providing um, coaching to private clients and then teaching at festivals and just I had my own show at the time. It was just really amazing. And I saw the value of purifying communication and speech. I saw the value in that, not only in myself, but in, in my interactions with others and how others responded to me in that place and how my patients were, were just, or my clients and patients at the time um, were, were getting to know themselves in a different way. And that was something that I couldn't put down. And I didn't put it down um, until probably 2022. I put it all down. And I went into a very reflective place for about a year and a half. And in that reflective place, I did more, you know, field research where you're just listening and listening and listening and listening and then coming into contact with various different kinds of people on my journeys and giving them what I do now in that communication mastery place, but doing it in a covert way, not in like a, you're my client, I'm your therapist way, but <laughs> I'm in an interaction and just kind of, you know, giving a, a different lens or a perspective and like, hey, can I offer something on that? Hey, have you have you looked at it in this way? Hey, did you did you see that there's this is a possibility? And just in that, it just evolved. And it, you know, when you get to a place where you know something's just gonna explode out of you and you can't stop it, that's that's what's been happening, and and that's how. I made that transition from speech language pathology, which I still am a, a clinician. I still work in that medical field while still knowing that this is the thing that wants to firecracker out of me. Beautiful. Number seven, how do you measure the success of your interventions, particularly in areas like self-advocacy and interpersonal relationships? So but this is very subjective. It's a very subjective measure. We we can't cookie cutter something like this. It has to be very customized to every person and and every person's experience. And so it's it's whether a person can reach the goal that they are looking to reach, whether it's getting a job interview and landing the interview, whether it's getting a girlfriend or a boyfriend or getting a um, getting on top of conflict within their relationship with their spouse or um, learning how to talk to their children better or um, finding that inner inner lion or inner king or inner queen and being able to function from that place of confidence. And when when a person can express themselves in that way, like, hey, wow, that really helped me. And this is how it helped me. And this is what I saw happen as it helped me in the moment that I did it. That is the measure 
of outcomes. So good. So good. Number eight. Can you share an example of how improving communication skills has transformed a client's leadership capabilities? Yes. I have been on so many teams. Like when you're studying to be a speech language pathologist, they throw you into group projects all the time and you get watched and you get evaluated and you get, you know, feedback and criticism and you really learn how to be okay with criticism because you want to be a really great therapist, right? So we in knowing what's what we need to work on and then overcoming that is self-advocacy hmm. and being able to do that with a patient so i worked with a patient who had um who had never had a, a therapist for, for their stutter and this was a person who was incarcerated they were in a mental hospital psychiatric hospital better way to say it and um they had they they knew they had a stutter but had never worked with a therapist before and I, I was just so blessed to meet this man and um, to share to share all these good qualities about himself because he had grown up in a place where he was just in and out of the system, like in and out of the jail system. And then now in the psychiatric facility, forensic center psychiatric facility, where he was doing um, mental health work so that he could be acquitted from the charges that were against him. So in that time, I got to meet him and um, work on his stuttering and really help him see the strengths in himself. So our work together, he was able to research stuttering, research about his own stutter and kind of see who he was through the progression of that stutter and who he became as a man. And then he presented himself like to the entire floor, the entire unit, and all these men watched him present his presentation, his speech. And afterwards he was like, wow, I have never done anything like that before. And I got so many compliments from the men on the unit and it makes me feel really confident. And man, I can't tell you how, how amazing it feels to contribute to something like that. And so did I answer your question? Oh, you are answering it. Yeah. Yes. Answer, okay. Ask the question one more time. Mm -hmm. You said, can you share an example of how improving communication skills has transformed a client's leadership capabilities? Right. So in this, it's like, we we didn't really work on the stutter itself we worked on his feelings and attitudes and how he felt about having the stutter and and shaping that into a, a a manner of education and so what i generally do with my patients is that i teach them about their communication issues and then learning how to educate themselves on that so they can educate others thereby creating a bridge in the, in the gap between understanding and misunderstanding. Awesome. Number nine. What are some of the most innovative techniques you've developed for managing cognitive communication deficits? I don't think I've created any of those things. And I will, I will say that I don't, I haven't really created any innovation in cognitive communication deficit retraining or rehab. However, what I do really appreciate is the work of physical therapists who really understand cognitive remapping and, and, and body mechanics at the same time. And so I have stumbled across this extraordinary field of study called functional neurology, where it integrates the use of stimulating cranial nerves to improve physical function and this and and function in life and and cognitive function at the same time. And so I've definitely over the years 
you know, I didn't have access to that education before. And so I've definitely implemented those practices into what I'm doing. And I'm seeing gains in my patients like almost immediately, which is really cool because it seems like you're not doing anything at all, but it's like you're integrating both hemispheres of the brain. You're doing dual task work with physical and cognitive components. And you're really putting a cognitive load on a person while they're going through a physical experience, which improves cognitive communication outcomes. It's, it's extraordinary. It's just extraordinary to see this kind of, uh, this kind of expression um, through through what's already given to us. It doesn't, there's, you don't need innovation. You just need to use what's there in, in an innovated way. So I'm not an innovator in that way, um, but I do appreciate the innovations that others that have brought to the field of neural rehab, neuroplasticity, neurogenesis, and rehabilitation. And I just give kudos to them. That's perfect. <laughs> I, I have an appreciation for this, really even occupational therapists, physical therapists and occupational therapists alike, especially the ones that think outside of the box. And there's some of the most ama amazing innovators ever. It's, it's beautiful and what they do to try to help their patients. And I also disagree with you. <laughs> I think you are an innovator. You just do it in a different way. So fair enough. I think, I think the innovation is helping others understand what their patients mean when they do certain things or yeah. say certain things so that there's an there's an interaction that isn't a uh it's not a like i'm trying to make you do this thing it's like i want to understand you so that we can get to the next level together um and, and a lot of my work is around that. So to get back to the question is, um, oh, I'm on the other question. Oh, so many good memories. I'm just, <laughs> it's so good. So many good memories. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think this is question 10. I, I've lost count now. <laughs> um, I don't even know what number of broadcasts this is because I've started announcing them like, oh, this is episode five. And then I've already lost count. Anyway, I think it's six. Anyway. Uh, how do you address the emotional aspects of communication challenges, especially with those who have experienced trauma? This is another subjective experience. The goal is to have an emotional response without a subjective experience. And so the, the, the subjective experience is a behavior as a result of what we're experiencing internally. And that behavior then is like an external cry or a lashing out or yelling or uh, withdrawing or whatever else. And it's not to say that we don't want to have any kind of external response. Of course, there's, you know, there's times where an external response is warranted, like when we're grieving or, um, when we're you know very burnt out from from work or you know the the world is getting to us however we're going through these experiences day to day and when we see patterned like responses in ourselves that's a trigger to improve this this objective viewpoint of why we were experiencing what we're experiencing and why we're behaving the way we are so it's it's a it's a self awareness approach of coming into the place of I'm going to see my subjective response I'm going to see my behavior I'm going to see how I lash out how I lose it how I um, withdraw how I freeze how I do all of those things and then I'm going to see what it means to me from an objective point of view. So what am I feeling in that moment that's causing that behavior? And can I shape that behavior into a new behavior that allows me to just experience the emotion running through me without a behavioral response? So good. Number 11. You all right? Yeah. 
Okay. Sometimes I'm like, you know, the question is like so deep. So it's like, we could talk about each question in like for a long time. <laughs> but I'm trying. Well, like well, I wanted to make sure that you were done because you have a look of passion and determination in your eyes right now. And it's, I think you're getting pumped up talking about this stuff. So I didn't want to interrupt you. Just making sure. I appreciate that. Okay. I think this is question 11. What role does technology play in your therapy and coaching practices? And how has it evolved over your 25 year career? So good question. Technology. <laughs> Communication doesn't require technology. It just, <laughs> just doesn't. Face to face is like where it's at. However, at the same time, it's it's like in in a so I have this belief that when we're when we're in a session with someone, we want our attention to be on them mm. and and to provide that that connection in in the session. Now, if it's appropriate to use various cognitive shaping apps, and if they like those apps, then it would be appropriate, you know, to share those apps. And what's so cool about that is being able to kind of sequence through how to access the app, troubleshoot any issues that are come up when they're trying to access the app, you know. So I've definitely worked with elders where they're like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> and it's like, I don't want to use my phone. I'm like, but there's this thing on you could totally do. It. And they're like, really? And you can teach them how to do these things that they didn't want to do. Right. And so in that regard, it's really great. Uh, I really, I really am. I will say discerning when it comes to using technology today, like today, what a amazing thing. This woman, um, she, we had a, we had a conversation. Um, I was doing some cognitive stuff with her, some proprioceptive, like memory kind of integrated task. And she, um, we started talking about the current events and she wanted to, she just wanted to talk about the current events. So I was like, you know, um, you know, do you get to a place where you're feeling like worried or upset or in fear? She asked me that question. And I was like, that's a really interesting question. And I said, well, you know, I, I know who my maker is and I know that my maker created all things. And in creating all things, if I stay focused on my maker, it allows me to stay in peace. And I felt her relax in that. And she's like, I really should, I should read the Bible more. And I was like, do you want to do that? And she said, yeah. And I was like, let's do it. Let's put it, let's put the app on your phone and I'll show you how to access it. And you can listen to it whenever you want. Mm. And I taught her how to do that. She did it. And then when I left the room, she was listening to the gospel of John. And I was like, what a blessing, you know? And I just know that in that moment, it's like, she got what she wanted and I just got a blessing. So it's like, there's right and wrong places to use technology, but if it's gonna serve the the purpose of connection and what a person really wants to achieve, then absolutely. I was working with a guy who has a traumatic brain injury and he's applying for new jobs and um, needed to update his resume. So I taught him how to use Canva and uh, make his resume like really nice. And so um, there's definitely functional ways to to do that. If it's not a functional way, then I just feel like it's not it's not a good um, choice. It's not a good choice mm -hmm. session. Yeah. But, you know, on the other side, my mom's not my client. And uh, I told her when I left the Canada, when I left Canada for the United States, I said, look, you're going to have to learn how to, you know, video chat me. Otherwise, we're never going to talk. <laughs> and so I taught her how to video chat. And now she video chats with me. And, you know, it's just like, it's, it's amazing, because now I can see her and my dad. And it's, it's so good. So time and place, I'd say. Good answer. Number 12. Oh, can you discuss a case where your detox intervention? In, hold on, let me start. <laughs> my, my tongue like got in the way of my mouth there for a second. Can you discuss a case where your detox interventions significantly impacted a client's cognitive function and communication skills? I knew you were going to ask this question, and so it goes back to that place of real um, rigid 
I want, I'm using this word very strategically. It's a rigid perspective on healing. Mm -hmm. And when there's that rigid perspective on healing, because allopathic medicine has said to them, you'll never, you'll never get better from this. You'll never improve. You'll, it's, you're just going to, it's, it's just going to get worse over time. Um, when you believe those things, it's really hard to break that shell when you get to a client. So I just educate and educate and educate. I can't say personally in my clinical experience that I've had people go through a detoxification. However, I've read so many accounts of people going through de detoxification and I've also experienced it in myself having, having had several neurological impacts where I had mold poisoning, I had systemic candida, I, you know, was experiencing extreme amounts of inflammation and pain that was causing me to be subdued and depressed. And in my pursuit of holistic rehabilitation, I found these products that support improved antioxidant functioning inside of my body, improved mitochondrial functioning, giving my body an opportunity to heal itself. Mm. And I share that with everyone. I share it with everyone. Including me. Yeah, I yeah. do. And when I share it with everyone, do you know what they do? They're like, huh, really? I'm like yeah really like really <laughs> and nothing changes because it's a it's a it's it's a veil and they and there's they're so focused on this allopathic model because it's an indoctrination mm -hmm. it is it's an indoctrination and i say that as respectfully as possible because it does have its place but in chronic issues, there is a different and better way. And I say that to anyone who's listening, who is looking for a, a way to manage chronic symptoms in a non-allopathic way, that is getting to the root cause instead of just getting to the, the symptoms of it. The symptoms mean that there's there's an activation of something at the root. And if we don't get to the root, we will we will not solve anything on top of that. Perfect. Do you want to do you want to plug that company that detoxes? Well, there's three companies that I fully support yeah. and you can find those links on my stand store on my Instagram and the first one is Protandem and Protandem is a blend of herbs that increases the, the use, increases the amount of glutathione that's produced in the body and then allows the body to systematically rebalance its oxidative stress and antioxidants that then create a, a loss of aging. So mm -hmm. aging is tested by way of oxidative stress and how much inflammation and oxidative stress we have in our bodies and pro tandem has these intricate intricately woven herbals that we've all taken mm -hmm. but in a tiny little capsule it's not even a capsule there's one capsule that is for mitochondrial support and there's another uh blue, little yellow pill that is um just perfectly formulated to to do that synergistic work to activate the system the system to do what it's meant to do it is meant the system is meant to heal itself and so protandem is the first one um the second one is the detox pack um and the detox pack has a zeolite binder and it has um a mineral that helps to remove the food source of parasites in the body so what parasites do is they burrow into organs and they cause organ problems and if we can get the toxification out 
by way of binders and minerals, then we can flush those out and we can experience the aftermath of that. And so clarity of mind and clarity of um, like smell in your body, clarity of movement. And that one is like, it's a, whoever created these things, I'm just like, wow, you guys like really, you, you really got to the core of the issue. Um, that one is from, um, the good inside touch tone and it's a D it's called a, the zeolite detox pack. And it, within the first two weeks of me doing that, I had, I had passed parasite nest eggs and I, I was like, whatever this is. And then the seven days that I went off of it, there was a proliferation of symptoms like eczema and body odor and, um, oh, just like bad breath and, you know, just like poor skin quality and, you know, all of these things. And you don't really think about it until you don't have the symptoms come up. And then all of a sudden the symptoms come up and you're like, whoa. So that led me to the third one, which is through Rogers Hood Apothecary. And Rogers Hood Apothecary has created a product called Parify. And it's a 30 day supply of a parasite cleanse, which includes a heavy metal detox and um, a sustain and a binder that helps to remove parasites. And I can't, I honestly can't recommend these products enough. Mm. And it's gonna take a little bit of stepping outside of the box because when you see parasites coming out of you <laughs> when you see them it, it infuriates you it infuriates you because no one told you no one in your you when you went to go get a regular checkup from your doctor they weren't like maybe you should do a parasite cleanse Maybe, maybe the reason why you have ADHD and, and motor issues and neurological issues is because you're, you have a lot of toxins in your body, like glyphosate and, um, heavy metals, aluminum. We're cooking on aluminum all day, every day. We use aluminum foil to cook with. Like we, we are not educated in some of these areas. So now we're going to a person who we trust with our lives, with our lives. And they're not giving us food and, and nutrition and processes and protocols to keep our lives healthy. And I think it's so infuriating for me. Mm -hmm. It's so extremely infuriating. And there is a different way and I just encourage people to, to dig deep, go, go to scholar.google.com, go to pubmed.com and look up the research. Don't be one of those people who's just like, man, my doctor said I don't No, no, you have the power in you to do the thing, to make your life extraordinarily awesome. You don't need to lose limbs. You don't need to lose toes. You don't need to do that. Okay. That's my rant. <laughs> I think question 14. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I didn't number them. <laughs> My mistake. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. I, because I, here's the thing. I wanted you to talk about the parasites because I'm actually doing that detox, as you know. And uh, yeah, every time I, I look down and I like you little demons. <laughs> what, what kind of havoc were you creating in my life? Screw you. Okay. Anyway, next question. Yeah. What are some of the most common misconceptions about communication disorders that you encounter in your practice? This is a good one. Most people believe that people with communication disorders can't understand you. <laughs> but that's the opposite. Most times they can understand great, greatly more than than what they can express and there's such a, a great deal of sensitivity required because when we speak to someone about what they're experiencing and we're not listening to those subtle communicative responses we can deem someone incompetent 
-hmm. We can put them into a place that is subordinate. We can lose the, the focus of wellness in their life and just kind of chuck them to the side and say, well, this is just how you're going to be for the rest of your life. And that happens. Yeah, it does happen. It happens more often than you think, you know? And so what I'll say secondary to the technology part. So I was very narrow focused in that technology has improved the way that people who are nonverbal or have trouble expressing themselves communicate. And technology in that manner has bridged the gap between being silent and, and having a voice. Mm -hmm. And so in that, there's been an extraordinarily promising field of study called alternative and augmentative communication, which allows a person to learn a, how to use a device that lets them be a self-advocate and support themselves in being understood, having their needs met, um, expressing their wants and desires and complex desires. And that's, it's, it's such a beautiful thing when you, when you have someone who isn't a verbal communicator or someone who has trouble communicating verbally, and now we give them a device that they can navigate independently or can navigate with some support and you just hear their voice come out and their personality. And there's a, like a, a reflex of like relaxation because they, they are now understood. Mm. And so, um, yeah, that's the biggest misconception. Just because someone doesn't talk doesn't mean they don't hear you and doesn't mean they don't understand you. Yeah, you're a hundred percent right. I worked with complex disabilities for 18 years and getting to work with assistive technology devices back. I mean, this has been years now since mm -hmm. I've been out of it, but now to see now that I'm in that space of virtual reality and some of the other fu future technologies that are now available that are helping for, you know, with people with accessibility issues, people that are disabled, people that have communication, even ASD and other mental health disorders, like this technologies that are out are really helping level the playing field to give people opportunities that they couldn't have had before. Exactly. So I'm glad that you circled back on that and talked about it because I didn't want to correct you, but I'm glad that you brought that up because it is important and it's exciting because it's giving hope to people that didn't have hope before. Yes. It's providing opportunity for people that didn't have opportunities before. So it's very, very exciting. That's a great That's answer. Great. Like there's, you know, I, I ha there's this awesome place here in Denver that um, uses technology to support enhanced neurological function. Mm -hmm. I haven't used them personally, you know, but I definitely send clients there because it's it's an integrated movement, cognitive, you know, technology based approach that gets results. And yeah. so um, in my personal sessions right now, I'm not really dealing with a lot of tech, but I definitely have taught people to use communication devices and you just really do. You get to know people and um, it's it's a real it's a really big gift for sure. Absolutely. Next question. How do you adapt your communication strategies when working with clients from diverse cultural backgrounds? I think it's important to know that everyone has their own revelatory process and not everyone knows exactly what we know. And so to code switch, code switch is to like use language, use different languages and switch from one language to another. And I use this word code switch, this, this concept code switch, when we're speaking to culturally diverse populations because they, they require a different sensitivity. And so everyone deserves to be heard and everyone deserves to, to express themselves, even if they're spewing hate, you know, even then. And in that there's, Sometimes we we learn how to, you know, either be quiet 
or learn to listen and just receive. We learn to provide a question or a motivational question that helps to extract more of their belief and their 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 stand, their standpoint. And so I think the key to interpersonal interactions and communication with, with culturally diverse populations, being a person of cultural diversity myself, is can I allow can I allow that person to be who they are while also allowing myself to be who I am without needing to change myself or change them? Speaking the vernacular of of love, speaking the vernacular of kindness and patience, it's not it, it, like the, these are not culturally diverse qualities or characteristics that can can be expressed through the way we communicate. And so there's certainly, um, you know, with the uproar of all the things that are happening in the world, I'm doing a lot of listening and I'm seeing, I'm seeing a lot of anger and a lot of pain and a lot of um, hurt. And, and it's, it's not something that needs to be fixed, but it needs to be heard. And in that hearing, a solution will arrive. And so in my culturally sensitive approach, I definitely want to learn and constantly evolving how I implement strategies to administer and to show up with kindness and curiosity and love and patience, um, because everyone everyone deserves to be heard, even if they hate me because I'm Indian or they hate me because I'm brown, you know. And that happens still. Mm. Which is very disappointing because you're an amazing human being. Well, the question would be, thank you, I appreciate that. The question would be, is that person also an extraordinary human being? And I, you know, I would say, yeah, I would say that person is is also an extraordinary human being, even though they they have an affect that is um, offensive at times. Ah, you know what? I can relate to that. <laughs> and by the way, and sometimes, sometimes people just need to yell and then and then have someone listen to them yell, and then they, and then that person that was yelling gets to feel like a giant douchebag afterwards because they're like, "Oh, <laughs> why'd I do that?" But it's always good to have friends that just, you know, let let them go off for a little bit to let them be heard, and then have them go, "I'm so sorry." <laughs> yeah. Anyway, next question. Yes, Woo! I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what do you believe is the most overlooked aspect of effective communication in both personal and professional settings? Definitely listening, <laughs> definitely. Um, I think that this is just a question that we already did asked in a different way. It's it, like the, the key to all awesomeness in interpersonal relationships and relating is learning to listen through the lens of curiosity. Why? Why does this person feel this way? Why Why are they interacting with me in this way? What's going on? Why? Um, I can see that this is painful. Where does that pain come from? Is it right now? Does it happen from, is it from, you know, years ago? Do you feel like you're being triggered in some way? Um, we're we're so used to giving an answer yeah. so used to giving an answer and we're so used to being right right it's like i know the answer and my answer is right <laughs> and um we're yeah. <laughs> i'm like that too i mean you know as a, as a therapist like people come to me for answers and it's like yeah like I, I gotta have an answer you know but if i don't have if i don't listen enough mm. personally or professionally then i will give a wrong answer and I don't want to do that. I don't want to give a wrong answer. And that was just exemplified when you asked that question about the technology, right? Like I didn't, I didn't see it from a bigger perspective until I saw it from a bigger perspective and then was able to express from that perspective. And, and that comes from this degree of curiosity. Like even in myself, while we're having this conversation, I'm like, hmm. like I was still like going through that question. It's like, Am I truly listening to the question? Am I truly listening to the person express themselves? Am I listening between the lines? 
Can I be with someone who's nonverbal, not saying anything, crying, being really sad, being upset, being angry, being frustrated, whatever? Can I be in that space with that person without needing to say anything? Can I do that? And if I can't do that and it makes me it makes me anxious inside, then then this is where the beginnings of that quality and that characteristic of deep listening comes into play because first it's like well if i am dealing with anxiety within myself and that stops me from listening to the person outside of me then how effective am i in this interpersonal relationship right personal personal or professional so um yeah i think that answers your question it does it does <clears throat> Next question. How has your understanding of the brain communication connection evolved over your career and how has it influenced you in your practice? I'm going to tell a story. So there is a woman I worked with in Florida during my certification year. I was a brand new student out of school and I met a woman who was three years post her hemorrhage. So she had elective surgery to clip an aneurysm. And during the clipping of the aneurysm, she bled out and she ended up with no speech. She could say, la, me, na, ma. That's all she could say. And I, I, you know, I saw her and she was in distress. Like I still have this imprinted visual of her face and I will never forget it because she was in such distress. And I was like, why is she in such distress? I'm like, and why has no one understood her? Why? Mm -hmm. Like if someone, you know, like why hasn't someone understood? So I, I just kind of asked some yes, no questions, very simple. Yes, no questions. And it turned out that the catheter that she had in, she didn't need anymore. And it was causing a lot of pain. Oh. And I was like, this is so simple. It's so simple. Why, why did it take me, not the, not the nurse or not the doctor or not the person who's like putting the catheter in or taking it out or putting the order in or whatever. I'm just a speech therapist. You know, I'm just a speech language pathologist. I'm not all I'm not the glorified doctor, okay? So interesting for me to have that experience with her. So I talked to the nurse and I was like, I'm pretty sure the catheter needs to come out. Sure enough, the catheter needs to come out. And um, I knew she couldn't talk. I knew she couldn't speak with words. And, but she was so expressive, like with her face and with her gestures and with her voice and the prosody and the inflection of her voice. And she was, she just, I was just able to understand her. She, I asked her, I was like, what, what do you want to do? How do you want to, how do you want to deal with your communication disorder? I was like, do you, do you want a communication board? She's like, no. I was like, do you want a device? like an AAC device? She's like, no. I'm like, you wanna talk? She's like, yep. I'm like, okay, let's do it. So I researched, I researched like the hardest case that I could find. And it was a case study on one person. And the study came from 1965, I'm sure. And I followed that protocol and I took the words the syllables that she could say, love me, no mal. And I put them in, in a fashion of putting them, like reduplicating them and then changing what she could say from those syllables and then breaking it up. So from love me, no mal, I know she, I knew she could say, l, a, m, e, ow. So that's five sounds that she could do. And that's a lot. Mm. And so with mm, I could shape other sounds. With l, I could shape other sounds. With e, I could shape other sounds. So I, I was able to kind of systematically go through and create more syllables, reduplicated those syllables, like two together, then three together, then 
started creating words that were functional for her in the environment that she was in. And then we moved to short phrases that were functional for her. And then we moved to sentences that were functional for her. And then one day I walked in and I walked in to the nurse's station and they, they were applauding. And I was like, what, what's going on? And they, they congratulated me and they were like, your patient ordered breakfast this morning. <laughs> Wow. And she, and she spoke what she needed for breakfast. And I was like, wow, what a blessing, you know? But during that time when we worked together, I worked with her for like six months and it was intensive. I worked with her for like 60 to 90 minutes a day. It was very intensive. We cried together. We laughed together. We worked really hard together. And she, um, there's one time where she, like, she, called me over and she like wanted to whisper in my ear and I was like waiting for her to say something and then she realized she couldn't say the thing that she wanted to say and we both laughed so we just had this like really amazing relationship in in her place of disorder but then got to experience this other side of her that allowed her to express what she needed in the moment that she needed it and that was that's that's how neuroplasticity and knowing not just thinking but knowing and believing that if we administer the right stimulus we can see improvement in neurogenesis neuroplasticity improvement of cognitive functioning improvement of communication functioning so that's why whenever a doctor says you'll never talk again or you'll never do that again or whatever the doctor says that says you'll never blah 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 again cancel delete get that out of your vocabulary and out of the vicinity of your ears because in that moment you have a choice you have a choice to believe in the lie that says your brain is not going to get better or you have a chance to believe in the research that says neuroplasticity is real neurogenesis is real under the proper conditions so now we have to look at what the proper conditions are and how to administer the right stimulus because it's possible so good <laughs> so good my energy is picked up i apologize for my head bobbling <laughs> i hope it's not distracting on your end <laughs> next question can you describe a situation where your expertise expertise let me start over can you describe a situation where your expertise in both rehabilitation therapy and communication coaching provided a unique solution for a client or patient? Um, I think I definitely just shared that. Um, yeah. It's so what I'll share on the second side of that is in the moments where she got the the the, the target wrong, I never said no. I never said, no, that's wrong. Never, never once. I always just reinforced the, the accurate targets. And when you do that in life, and when you do that in yourself, you're reinforcing the accurate targets instead of spending all of this unnecessary energy telling yourself or telling someone else what they're doing is wrong. And of course, in interpersonal relationships that are more intimate, there might be a little bit more digging into what's right and wrong because, you know, you're here as a collective conglomerate, whether it's friends or intimate relationship to break those bonds. So, um, yeah, there's going to be like, I, I have really deep relationships with some of my friends. I'm like, I don't know, man, that doesn't seem right. And you can have those conversations with them because, you know, we, we, we trust each other. Um, but when you're working in this, when I'm working in this, uh, client, uh, rehab therapist place, my goal is, is to reinforce 
the positive that I see, the the outcome, the the achievement of the goal, and to reinforce that ongoing and ongoing and ongoing until they can reinforce their progress in themselves, and then then it's a snowball effect, right? So um, I that's what I saw with my client who you know was was someone who who had four syllables and five sounds. There was a snowball effect, you know, after that weekend where she she ordered her her breakfast i never saw her again and i was like okay like she she left the facility and i was like wow my work is done but i know that that work continued because we had set her up on that foundation of of that inner support that says don't focus on what you're doing wrong focus on what you're doing right i love that that's a good and that's that's good advice for everyone too by the way appreciate that love that okay what do you see as the biggest challenges facing the field of speech language pathology in the coming years? And are you prepared to address them? Yeah, uh, great question. I, I, I do believe there's an integration with nutrition, detoxification to improve cognitive functioning and to really collaborate with physical therapists and dual task performance so that we can increase the outcomes of patients in a shorter amount of time. I think when we have segregated approaches to goal and, and goal achievement and outcomes, um, it can cause segregation in outcome achievement. And so I, I, I really am looking for more of an integrated approach where we, we don't, we work together but we don't overrule each other hmm. and we bring what each one of us has a gift in and we we see the patient not for an hour each but all together we see the person for like you know 6 hours you know it would be great just to see a person or a group of people in that way to um to support that integration um more collaboration i would say interdisciplinary collaboration whether it's patient um direct patient care or outside of patient care just really um looking at multi multi-faceted multidisciplinary approach my first placement outside of my um certification year uh, my first solo experience it was such an extraordinary team because we were able to meet every single week and talk about our patients from every perspective and then go through problem solving and be like well have you tried this have you tried this um yeah i'll try that this is a great uh, suggestion i will do that like having respect for one another in in that manner and then coming to each other as as experts in the field bridging the gap towards what the patient wants to achieve and i think that's what's truly missing from the field from a um system systemic approach through the through the allopathic uh lens and medical model there that piece is really missing so i often feel like we are on an island and we are on an island by ourselves and uh there is not a lot of integration and i do believe that there will be more opportunity for this going forward and i encourage it and i am very excited for it that's so wonderful all right this is question 20. oh my goodness okay how do you incorporate the latest research in neuroplasticity into your treatment approaches for both speech disorders and communication skills so neuroplasticity says that no matter what happens to the brain no matter what impact the brain has there is a way to restore because there's we don't we don't use our entire brain all day every day we use parts of our brain and our brain is uh, designed to use the least the least energetic means to carry out a task. It's very energy efficient. And so with neuroplasticity, as long as we're constantly providing new stimulus that is, that is directly related to what the patient wants to achieve, 
constant learning process, just like not halting that learning process, just being in a constant state of learning, we're inevitably going to activate neuroplasticity, which is just like inevitable. So I would say that constant desire for learning and never really thinking that you've you're done learning and it's just do new things all the time and i'm using these generic terms like all the time but like literally like all the time like once you once you're done learning something um implement it and then move on to something else so that you can continue to build upon that and what you're doing is inducing neuroplasticity you're you're creating new pathways you're creating new maps in your brain for various various motor movements um speech tasks all kinds of things i'll tell you that there was a time when uh every second word out of my mouth was a cuss word and i really i tapped into neuroplasticity i was like okay here's my habituated response but i can map in a different way so now how am i going to map all of the cuss words out of my speech because i am supposed to be a professional <laughs> You know, and so I had to I had to kind of go through that myself. And so um, I had a friend who did it with me, which was really great. And we we just kind of learned, implemented new ways of speaking with each other and speaking with the world and interacting in a space where we were so acutely aware of what was wrong but not reinforcing what was wrong, just constantly reinforcing that right thing. And that's the key, I think, to true neuroplasticity is really focusing on little increments of change and little increments of learning and reinforcing that and amplifying that so that there's greater and greater achievement in that same manner that I expressed earlier, which is that like that snowball effect where the learning just builds and builds and builds on itself great answer last question oh wow this is my favorite question can you share your vision for the future of communication therapy and coaching and how you see your role in shaping that future I see a future where we communicate with each other from a place of true desire of love for one another and, and kindness and sweetness and patience. And I, I want to contribute to that by exemplifying that first by changing myself. And so in every moment that I have to show up in a way that's different than the ways of my history mm -hmm. as a person who has been traumatized, right? So now we're looking through this lens of trauma, like everyone's been traumatized in some way and we've all learned to communicate as a, react as a reactionary response. And we've been indoctrinated with narratives that are not our own from media and um, habitual responses, habitual thought processes, habitual means of um, disengaging and dissociating. And connection is what we're truly seeking. And communication is the avenue, it's the vehicle to true connection. And communication isn't just words, it's how we behave, it's how we live our lives. It's our footprint in the world. And how I would love to, to contribute to that is to share with the world that there's a sweeter way to interact with the people that we love. There's a kinder way to interact with the person who hates us. There's a, a loving way to interact with a child who's thrashing on the floor with a behavioral outburst. There's healing to be had and received and, and experienced through 
self-analysis in, in communication patterns. And so if I were to offer something in the world, it would be to analyze the disorder, analyze what is wrong, don't reinforce it, analyze it, mm -hmm. and then create a reinforced response that is a counteractive response that supports a world that is in light, love, goodness, cherishing, hair, kindness, patience, whatever it is that is the thing that we're seeking, we can be that ourselves. And I think once, once we are that ourselves and the way that we communicate with one another, we can build we can build on top of that because we're no longer fighting to be heard or fighting to um, be who we are created to be mm. or just who we are. And we don't need to prove ourselves in that because we know who we are. And that's what I'd like to contribute to the world. You just talked about the fruits of the spirit praise the lord mm -hmm. amen well wow uh th that was amazing like getting i learned so much and then i have to like go back and there's things that i still have to learn now because you've opened up so many different doors and talked about so many different things and all of the stories and how you integrated your patience into the the stories and your answers was so awesome because it really kind of, of all the broadcasts of this 21 questions I've done, and I've loved every one of them, what I like about this the most is that we really got to see not only inside of your head, but your processes and how you really work with other people. You really painted that picture well. So I really love uh, you, you, your your answers and the way that you showed up and being so thorough. So thank you for that, um, because you didn't have to do that. You could have given just one sentence answers. Uh, I really couldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe two, maybe two, but but nonetheless, the the stories were perfect. They were they were so fascinating to hear because I, it was like I could see you there working and I could see you there with your patients and I could see the place that you were coming from. And that's a really cool thing. And if I'm hiring a coach or I'm hiring a therapist, that's what I want to hear. I, can, I want to know, this is how my therapist thinks when they're working with me. And you really painted that picture well. In other words, how would I hire you? So what I would like to do, because there's a lot of people right now that are watching that are going, hmm, how do I hire Odessa? So you have this, what I would like for you to do is to take this last moment to have the last word to share what's on your heart, but also make sure you plug where people can find you, where they can support you, and most importantly, where they can hire you. I'm so brand new. And what's so interesting of what you just asked of me, it, it comes there's this air of confidence, right? When we're speaking from a place of groundedness and patience and introspection. And there's also insecurity in that. There's also all this other stuff that's happening, right? And so I'm thankful that this experience allows me to get into that icky, insecure space and and say, hey, this is what I do, and to be okay with responses that may not be perfect to everyone. And that is a milestone in itself, being able to be in the world and not be affected negatively by responses that might not be so hot, that might not be so great. I might not be someone's Number one, and that's okay. But at the same time, knowing that there's a value in what I'm offering beyond what anybody might share as a rebuttal. And that's where I would love to support 
whoever's listening, because I've experienced the gamut of communication, humiliation, um, just being beat down by the system and needing to self-advocate, being beat down by bullies and needing to really understand my inner woman while I was a child. And if I can help anyone do that, if I can, if I can help one person do that, then I know that I've done my work on this planet. And so if you are that one person who's listening and you are going through an experience where you just can't figure it out and you know it's a pattern and you want to do better and you want to you want to learn something different about how awesome you are and how that expression of awesomeness can come through in the way that you communicate with others to really reveal your leadership potential and ability to guide others to greatness too you can link with me on instagram at hadassahrose.slp i'm sure it'll be like some caption on the screen or somewhere in this video um and you can connect with me at my website that's not yet built but it will be built soon at more than a speech therapist.com. And because the website isn't up just yet, because it's, I'm still in growth process is you can connect with me through um, email at Hadassah at more than a speech therapist.com. Or you can call me at, I think it's 917-870-0644. I might have to check that because it's a new number. I got a new number. And in that new number, um, I'm pretty sure it's 970-813-0644. We might have to cut this part out. I don't know. <laughs> I might have to get my phone. I mean, I could. I mean, I could just get it. I could start over this part. Um, I can't me... believe that you just gave out your phone number. Uh, is that your actual cell phone? That is my um, work number. Oh, you can give that what? out. Yeah, that's that you should give out your work number. Yeah. Oh, I so you I'm just right. gave out your cell phone. I'm like, you hey. don't want to do that. 970-813-0644. 970-813-0644. And if you get on my Instagram, um, my stand store is there and my schedule is there and um, my availability is there. And so I would love to hear from you, even if it, you know, if you have um a word to help guide to guide you know just don't try not to be mean because if you're mean you know it's not fun but if you want if you actually want to have a conversation i would love to have a conversation with you and um how to support the mission of communication become become so intrinsically curious about why you have the communication habits that you do and when you have an intrinsic awareness of why you communicate the way you do, you will inevitably, you will inadvertently, the outcome will be better communication because you will have the medicine in you to administer, to heal the part of you that's not healed. And if I can help you do that, if I can contribute to that in your life, I would love the opportunity.